Welcome back, everybody. I hope you didn't eat too much. We do not allow anybody to fall asleep in our lectures for any reason, okay? Now, if you fall asleep at a UFO conference, you might want to get more sleep, okay? Because, you know. All right, our next speaker of the day um, became employed in, uh, by the government in 1989 as a, um, a security specialist. During his uh, federal career, he has been in various specialties, including intelligence analysis, WMD security, anti-terrorism, counterintelligence, emergency management, physical security, personal security, response to CBRNE incidents, and incident command, operations security, information security, and many others. Um, he uh, has earned a degree in psychology from University of West Georgia with a minor in anthropology. And he has been awarded in his, in his military service the Department of Army Achievement Medal for Civilian Service, the Commander's Award for Civilian Service twice, and the Army Superior Unit Award, Global War on Terrorism Civilian Service Medal, and the NATO International Security and Assistance Medal. And he is currently the Director of the Anomalous Studies and Observation Group. And I wore my hat that I got at the Smithsonian Institute on the Space Force. If anybody can tell me what these people actually do, I would appreciate it. Um, it is a real branch of the service, because if you go to the gift shop at the Smithsonian, they have, they have displays for each of the official branches of service, and they have a whole one for the Space Force, which is really interesting. So uh, I, I, uh, I'm thinking I wore it because I think that our speaker might know a little bit about it. Maybe not. I don't know. So I, if, uh, if you don't, I didn't mean to embarrass you. So please join me in welcoming Trey Hudson. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing today? I've, I've got to say, this is the best looking group of attendees at a conference I've had this year. This is my first conference of this year. <laughs> okay, so who's ready to go on an adventure? Okay. This is one of those unique adventures that happens every once in a while, where people stumble across something so amazing, so uncanny, and so breathtaking, that it changes your perception on reality. It changes who you think you are, and maybe, possibly, what your place is in the universe. So let's call this anomalous geoconcentrations and divergent phenomenologies a case study. <laughs> or, how I went to an area known for Bigfoot UAPs and found some other very weird stuff. <laughs> Basically, it was an area that we discovered, and I'm going to go into that a little bit, and uh, has a very rich history that I'm going to go into, and we found the very weird stuff. So, but I've got to give you an apology, okay? Wah, wah, wah. Okay, everybody's going to, want, going to want to know where this place is. I'm not going to tell you, okay? I'm going to apologize up front. There's a reason for that. It's not because I'm just being a meanie, like my kids say. Is I'm trying to keep this location inviolate. I'm trying to keep it very special because if this location gets out, as we've seen in other unique sites all over the, the country, is it will automatically be sieged and overrun with curiosity seekers, thrill seekers, hoaxers, and people up to no good. So... What I tell people that come out and research with me, including guest researchers, is the experience is yours. This experience is yours, it's not mine. The only thing I uh, keep close to the vest is the location. So does, do you all accept my apology? Okay, thank you. Okay, a little bit about me. Uh, uh, my background, I'm an Eagle Scout. Uh, I earned the 50-miler uh, uh, Foot of Float Award uh, at scouting where you, you tr either hike or paddle more than 50 miles. I'm a U.S. Army or was a U.S. Army intelligence officer uh, with, uh, uh, affiliated with the U.S. Army Military Intelligence Corps. Uh, I joined U.S. Uh, Federal Service in, two, er, in 1989. Uh, I am currently a federal employee for two more weeks, and then I retire. <laughs> Uh, so I served a stint in Afghanistan as an anti-terrorism and operations officer. 
I'm a MUFON field investigator. I'm the current director of the Anomalous Studies and Observations Group. I'm one of those government guys that will tell you my government career has absolutely nothing to do with UAPs. Nothing. Everything that I'm going to talk about here is all extracurricular. So my team, uh, the Anomalous, Anomalous Studies and Observation Groups, is made up of a very unique group of individuals. Uh, we have folks from law enforcement, special operations, uh, paramedics, military intelligence, uh, emergency medicine. We have university degrees in nursing, management, public affairs, physics, psychology, engineering, philosophy, and many others. About 75% of my team are also trained in coordinate remote viewing. So that's, a, that's another little skill set that we keep in our back pocket. As you heard in today's lecture, that really opens, opens up your perception. You know, it really helps you maybe be attuned to things that are going on around you that might be missed by the, the average person on the street. The United States is a very weird place for a whole lot of reasons, but we're going to focus primarily on high strangeness. Uh, we have some unique areas here in the continental United States, and forgive me if I throw military jargon out there, CONUS is continental United States. Uh, we've all heard of the uh, famous Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, right? Okay. Uh, Katie Page will be speaking a little bit later about a very, very special place in Colorado that was featured in uh, the first Skinwalker Ranch book. Uh, Marley Woods, uh, Mr. Ben Hansen, who will be presenting later, uh, has had some experience there. The Bridgewater Triangle, uh, Chestnut Ridge, and a new location known as the Meadow, which is the area that I've been researching. This area has a really, really rich history. Like the other areas I just mentioned, it's home to an entire catalog of oddness and high strangeness. And just for brevity, let's call this area the Blackwater Anomalous Zone. That's a fictitious name. The fictitious place it is, uh, the name I use for it is the uh, Blackwater Nature Preserve. So we'll just call it the Blackwater Anomalous Zone. Uh, these are some of the uh, UAP things that have gone. A woman who works at the location close to the boundary of the BOZ reported, BAZ reported seeing an object in the sky above the area. She described the object as crystalline when it appeared from one of the clouds in the sky that day. It was described as a spinning crystal reflecting a myriad of colors as the facets picked up and reflected the available light. The object moved in a dense cloud and disappeared. She reported 10 minutes of missing time and was plagued by dreams of extraterrestrial abduction. Okay, this is the general area where the meadow is located. In 2005, the National UFO Reporting Center, three friends were hiking in the BAZ. They had stopped at a popular lake that evening. While there, they witnessed uh, mysterious flashes in the forest that could only be described as a sphere of plasma 300 yards away floating across the sky. This area has no electrical service. I know exactly where this area is, and I've researched it. Remember the term sphere of plasma, because that will come into play later. This is a rather long way to 96, a hunter on a remote hunting spot in the preserve. Uh, it was, uh, he had got there at 1 a.m. because he wanted to... Uh, claimed the spot for the last day of the hunting season. He had planned to sleep in his uh, vehicle overnight until the next day. He was reclining in his seat to nap when he saw a very bright object over one of the small cities in the distance. He figured it was a military aircraft from a nearby base. He was shocked when the light was instantaneously transported in the airspace above another town 15 miles away and then zipped back to its original location. He quickly grew bored watching the light and rode it off to sleep. He woke up about an hour later to, to notice that the light was still up to its antics. He took notice when a larger light entered the picture and was orbited by the smaller one. The smaller of the two lights then began a missile-like trajectory towards the lone hunter. The man felt that he could possibly, uh, this could possibly be a threat. He chambered around into his weapon. Uh, the light disappeared, and he quickly left the area and went home. And there are many, many other reports of UAPs and strange happenings in this area. Well, then we've got this fellow, Bigfoot. Uh, these areas have also seen Bigfoot. We've got Skinwalker Ranch, of course, the Chestnut Ridge. Uh, the Occupant Type 3 is a, a wonderful illustration by uh, Hal Crawford back in some of uh, Brad Steiger's early books. And so Bigfoot is very, very prominent in areas where you've also seen some UAP sightings. So, <laughs> oh. okay, uh, honestly, who, who's staring at his raccoon? I just want to know. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit of Bigfoot history in the uh, Blackwater Anomalous Zone. 
And I appreciate y'all laughing because y'all are going to get these bad jokes all through this presentation. Uh, in 1938, a local newspaper tells the story of a sheriff's posse hunting down a, quote, strange beast which farmers insisted was accompanied by a woman and a child both as savage in appearance and action as the man. There was no mention of this mysterious man beast again. Uh, since it was 1938 and this picture is color, this is a recreation, just for clarification. Uh, one morning in 1994, a married couple were fishing in a small boat at Stevens Lake in the BAZ. This is the exact same location where the individual saw the plasma balls of energy. Uh, they heard a loud scream. Uh, it started as a howl and developed into a loud scream. In 1993, uh, a little bit earlier, the stepfather of one of the above witnesses was also fishing at the Lake Spillway. It had to defer some rugged terrain to get to the location. While crossing the fire break, he noticed a set of footprints in the damped earth. He thought it odd that a person would be barefoot in such rugged terrain, so he found a bare foot the size of a human. Another man had reported that he and his family were picking huckleberries at Stevens Lakes. That's kind of a neat thing to do. In the, we're picking huckleberries uh, down at Stevens Lake, and he heard a commotion in the tree line. They turned towards the sound and saw a large, hairy man watching them. And when the man was spotted, he ran off. <laughs> Obviously, the family quickly left, too. This is a weird one. In 2003, a husband and wife were hiking and exploring the area between Coal Springs Campground and once again Stevens Lake. They found an old primitive hunter camp known by the locals as the Baskins Hollow Hunt Camp. It appeared that the hunters or campers had vanished. The tent chairs and coolers and other expensive gear were left in place. The tent looked as though someone had ripped their way out of it. It was never determined why someone would up and leave their expensive gear in the middle of the forest. Maybe they were frightened or removed from the site by forces unknown. This is a representation of an abandoned campsite with expensive gear uh, strewn about in the middle of the forest. In 2005, six friends were camping when they uh, had a frightening encounter. They were occupying a popular campsite at 10 p.m. and they heard what sounded like a rumble from uh, like a chainsaw failing to start. They reported the sound. Uh, they reported that the sound developed into a low hum. Excited by these happenings, they decided to scan the woods with a powerful spotlight. To their surprise, they caught in their beam a large, hairy, man-like figure. The creature was peering at them from behind a tree and watched them for about 60 seconds. It was described as ape-like. When they moved their light beam for a split second, the creature disappeared. And there are many, many others, like Bigfoot drinking a beer. Uh, okay, that's, not, that's, that's a statue of Bigfoot, and that's not really Bigfoot. So, you know, this area has UAPs, and it has Bigfoot. But what else does it have? Well, the Native American lore in this region talks about a, uh, a, a witch, a skinwalker-type entity known as the Spearfinger Witch. Uh, and she was rumored to steal children from their graves and eat their livers. So that was a very skinwalker-like, similar uh, folkloric uh, entity there. Uh, there was also the koala, a hairy human-eating beast, Tons of ghost stories, many, many UAP sightings that we talked about, and tragic events. This area is known for bodies being found, murders, uh, things like that. So it's a very strange, weird area. It's one of those areas that you just hear about from time to time that something's not right about it. Something's off. Well, we were going to research a remote location based on haunted folklore in this area. Uh, in 2016, now we had heard uh, rumors of a haunted road. And while we were researching this haunted road, which turned out to be a bust, back at base camp, our base camp operator had an amazing UAP encounter. Now, don't laugh at me. This is my really crude recreation of this. And we'll see. What happened is he first saw a beam of light come down, which he thought was lightning. And then the moon came out. And then the moon started moving from the right to the left. Now, I don't know about here in Arkansas, <laughs> but, you know, in this location, the moon doesn't move sideways. And then a pinprick appeared, and it got larger and larger, like the iris of a camera opening up, until all you were left with was like a ring of fire, a circle of diamonds effect like you see on an eclipse. Now, if you had a UAP experience like that, would you sit up and take notice? Yeah, absolutely. So we're like, yeah, forget that haunted road business. This is where we're going to research. So this area quickly became the focus of our attention based on this sighting. We decided a remote quartz-filled meadow, oh, quartz, imagine that, 
A quartz field meadow about a, a quarter of a mile from the base camp would be a good place to concentrate our field research. And we started researching in earnest in about 2016. Why this big, and this is actually a photograph of the meadow. Why? We can set up teams watching this area, and if anything moves across it at night, we can pick it up with our thermal and or night vision. Uh, if it moves across the meadow, it'll leave footprints. You know, if it's one of the reported Bigfoot. We can also sit in the meadow and we can see the sky. Once again, we, maybe we can see one of the reported UAPs. And there's a ridge uh, uh, just off of the meadow where somebody can sit up and watch down in the meadow and watch the activity going down below. So it was a really good place to research. You know, all of these different type of activities going on. It was a good place where possibly we could see something. See something we certainly did. In July of 2016, we decided to do that very thing. Our concept of operation was this, is we were going to set up numerous teams in the meadow equipped with radios, FLIR, forward-looking infrared or thermal, night vision, all of them would be in communications with a base camp operator, and the idea was we were going to have an individual move across the top of the ridge and possibly flush anything down into the meadow so it could be captured by our teams down there. It didn't quite go the way we expected. We were going to have one individual be the uh, the ridge runner, he got to a well-known uh, landmark as he was moving into position and he got on the radio and he said, uh, I don't remember how I got here. I'm at this landmark, which was a branch across the trail, we all knew where it was. And he said, I don't know how I got here. So we automatically were thinking maybe it was a medical emergency. You know, maybe he was having an epileptic episode, a stroke, something like that. So our paramedic quickly got on the radio and said, Bob, and that was the gentleman's name, you know, repeat Mary had a little lamb, which he did fine. You know, can you feel your toes and your fingers and your feet and all of that? Yes, I can. You know, are you lightheaded? Do you have a headache? No. So, you know, we all have something called a normalcy box, and that's when something weird happens, we like to put it inside of that box of normality. And we're like, well, you know, maybe he was just focused on what he was doing and forgot, and, you know, we've all driven to work and don't remember how we got there. So, yeah, it was a common, yeah, you know, we'll just blow it off. Well, it gets even stranger. He moved across the top of the ridge, dropped down on the west side of the, uh, the meadow, and started working his way across. My team is watching him through their thermals, and they see his heat signature, a man-shaped heat signature, walking along, because he had radioed us and told us that he was down in the meadow. That heat signature shrunk into a ball of energy. It moved several hundred meters in about eight seconds and then turned back into a man-shaped heat signature again. So the, the team, and let me tell you about this team. Two men were on that team that saw this. One is a, uh, a graduate from the uh, Georgia Institute of Technology with dual degrees in physics and philosophy. Served many years in the U.S. Army's Ranger Regiment, Special Operations. I was working as a systems engineer for a large uh, automotive company doing AI stuff. Other gentlemen also had a degree from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a master's degree in management from another institution. Uh, lifetime paramedic, uh, very used to stressful, strange, fluid situations. Both of these men are very solid and respected in their fields, not given to flights of fancy. They just observed this. Their friend turned into a ball of energy, moved several hundred meters, and then turned back into himself. So they quickly got on the radio. Once again, this was Bob. He's like a weird magnet, Bob is. You know, Bob, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. Why? Don't move. We're coming to you. So they get over to Bob, and as they're communicating with, they see this heat signature, bring a walkie-talkie up to its mouth, respond, bring it back. So obviously it was him. They go up and they said, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. Why? Why are you all bugging me tonight? And they said, you just turned into a ball of energy and shot across the meadow. And he's like, no, I didn't. I just walked over here. And they're like, that's not what we saw, which is interesting because you had two perceptions of the same event. There's something called the dual slit experiment, okay, in, in physics. It's where light exists both as a particle and as a wave, but at the same time. Both parties, Bob and the observer party, were experiencing the same event from different perspectives. So there's something weird about this place. Are you starting to pick up on this? There's something a little off about it? 
Uh, later on that night, uh, we got a call from our base camp operator that he saw, uh, saw us coming back into base camp and was wondering why we were coming over the top of the ridge, being that that terrain is very difficult. He said, I can see your green headlamps coming over the top of the ridge. And it's like, uh, Glenn, no, we're still in the meadow. And he goes, wait, those headlamps are about 20 feet in the air. Those aren't headlamps, those are orbs. So Glenn was observing green orbs uh, on the top of the ridge line. Uh, at about 0200 that night, uh, one of our individuals got up to take care of some biological business. You know, <laughs> you're camping, you know what that means. And after he was uh, taking care of the necessary issue and putting away the equipment, he uh, saw a white humanoid, much kind of like this one right here, peeking from around a tree. Which is interesting because this image I, res I have up here is actually from a page on folklore of that area, talking about a white humanoid that works in that area, that lives in that area, and we saw it. So the folklore is coming true. Okay, do you think it can get any weirder? Yeah, it does get weirder. Uh, Bob came to us the next day. Remember Bob, the missing time Bob, and the turning into a ball of energy Bob? Yeah, that Bob, you know, our friend Bob. He came to us the next day with his GPS. Now, Bob has a very rich background in law enforcement. He's a retired law enforcement officer from California. He also worked backcountry search and rescue for years in California, so he's a very competent woodsman. He always runs the uh, breadcrumb uh, feature on his GPS that tells him exactly where he's been. He shows us his tracks on the GPS from the night before, and it was several straight lines, several kilometers in length going from point A to point B, point B to point C, point C to point D, straight lines. Here's the catch. You can't move in a straight line over this terrain. It's too rugged. How would you move over rugged terrain in a straight line? If you were in the air. So the only way that Bob could have moved in a straight line is if he was in the air. He showed us this GPS track, and several witnesses saw it. It was a real thing, and we're like, Bob, please, as soon as you get back home, download this to a, uh, you know, your computer, email the file to us, and we'll open it up on the Garmin app, and we'll all review it. The track line wasn't there when he got home. It had been erased. Once again, how many times have you heard of equipment failure and things being erased? So that was just in July 2016, but it gets even stranger. This is probably the apex of high strangeness at, our, uh, at this site, uh, but believe me, there's a whole lot more. In February 2017, we went back to the meadow. Once again, we set up the same, uh, the same modus operandi. We had teams equipped with FLIR, night vision, and radios in the meadow, except this time we weren't going to make the mistake of sending somebody out by themselves to run the ridge. We had a three-man team. I was one of those team members running across the top of that ridge that night. Uh, while we were at the top of the ridge, we, down in the meadow, we saw two upright man-sized thermal shapes on our FLIR. When I say man-sized, about a meter and a half wide, two meters tall. So that's, you know, about 18 inches wide, about six foot high. Two of them. But they start off as one. Get big, get small, get big, get small, get big, and then split into two. It did not correspond with the known locations of any of our teams. That's why we carry radios, and nobody moves without permission. This was not our team members. Uh, David P. observed a box form in the meadow. This is a sketch that he did of the box. And you notice that it has a, a, a cruciform, a cross symbol right here. And it was a, basically like a large box or cube. We saw strange figures watching us from a small group of trees. Once again, not where we had any known members. And we decided to do something really, really cool. Is the box started dissipating by the time we were able to get the recording feature on our FLIRs going. So as it dissipated, we were able to get a team over into the area to where this thing was located. And when they approached the area where this box or cube was, they disappeared. We couldn't see them on the FLIR. Their, their heat energy was absorbed by something. And this is, uh, 
These are the two uh, figures watching us from the cops of trees, a group of trees. But you know what the really cool thing is? The two figures, we have that on video. The people disappearing into the box, we have on video. Does anybody want to see it? Okay, so we're going to start off with, oh, I'm sorry, let me, uh, 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 psych you out. Okay, another thing that we had was a strange figure in the wood line. I'm getting ahead of myself. Is uh, We took this photograph, and we didn't notice this until about a year later while we were uh, looking through our photographs. We had a strange figure watching us from the wood line. And there it is right there. And I'm going to zoom in on it. And what you can see there is a brow ridge, the muzzle, the face, and the shoulders, and an arm. We went back there. There's nothing, there's not a stump or a tree or anything that corresponds to that. You know, is that, a, is that proof positive of Sasquatch? No, it's not. But it's something that we did not observe when we were there, and we couldn't find anything that corresponded to it. And it matches our own experiences with the, uh, the white figure watching us and the folklore and reports from BFR of that area. So that's kind of cool. Okay, now are you ready to see the figures? Uh, okay, here we go. You see you have uh, one figure. It gets small and it gets tall. And it gets small, then it splits into two. But why don't we look at that and enhance that? I had a friend of mine in Hollywood slow that down and enhance it. So let's see what this looks like, okay? It gets small, gets tall. Gets really tall, gets small, gets tall again, and then splits into two. And this is actually the video of the team going into Halt. the uh, You're right on the, the edge of box. this fading away. You can see kind of the remnant of it right here. And you'll notice when they get into it, their heat signature disappears. Notice how hot their heat signature is. This was wintertime. You are February. right on the right hand. The way we're facing it, you are at the right hand edge of that box. And it's possibly 20 foot to the other edge. And there's a, it looks like a cross or an X. And then it's probably, judging by now, it's at least uh, 25 foot tall. Right. Did they just disappear? No. Mm -hmm. no. No, I'm looking at their thermal signature there. You are directly on it, but it has faded almost away. It's gone. Mm -hmm. It's completely faded away now, it's gone. Well, there's one of them right up under it. Or what was it? And the figures that were watching us from the tree line that we couldn't identify, you're gonna see that here in a little bit too. She'll pan over to the right and say, who are water those? And now they're completely gone. No heat signature at all. So they are, uh, they are into the wood line now. You should, should I, be picking them up. Because I can't see them. They're confused because there's no vegetation. It's, it would have been off to the right okay. uh, about 50 feet. No, to the right, in the same line, just walk to the right. No. Be My back. right, your left. <laughs> How many times have we heard that before? <laughs> you mean negative. It was My out right? in the your meadow right? itself. Okay, now they're coming back out. Moving out 
you just see how just brilliant their heat signature is all of a sudden. Ten four. Kind of scan to the right. Okay. So what are these things over here on the right? Look. We all know. Who is what is that? All right, there they are. Look at what is their team four? Grumpy's team four, correct? No. Three. Three. Team three, what is your location? So what's watching us? Remember, we just saw two figures earlier in the evening. We needed to recreate this. We wanted to debunk this. So we went back about a year later during the daytime where your body temperature is actually closer to the ambient uh, temperature of the surroundings. And we shot it both in regular, uh, regular view and also ran thermals at the same time. And these are two individuals approaching the same area where the, uh, where the cube was. You can notice, see how open this is back through here. This is the same time of year. And just bear with it. I was trying to work two pieces of equipment at the same time, so that's why it's kind of kind of choppy like that. You notice when they even went behind the really, really thick vegetation you could still see their heat signatures. It didn't completely disappear. So to this day, we've not been able to recreate that. So what was that? What would you call a space, a geospatial location, where people will go into and they seem to disappear, or their certain attributes of their essence seem to disappear? Portal, maybe. Hitchhikers, we've heard of the hitchhikers effect. After this outing, KP started having strange dreams about orbs coming in through her uh, window. These dreams eventually evolved into having nightmares about humanoid figures standing next to her bed, watching her. Where have we heard things like that before? The next day, JJ was filming her toddler, son, playing on an elliptical machine at her home. Through the viewfinder, she saw an orb circling her son. These orbs were not visible to the naked eye. At one point during the video, her son points up in the sky, or up in the air in her home, and says, ball, ball. He was seeing the orbs. And after that trip, I had a small LED flashlight disappear from a desk in my home, only to reappear the day, next day in the exact same location. So the hitchhiker phenomena is real. It does happen. Uh, in 2018, in April, we hiked to a similar meadow about seven miles from base camp. Uh, during the middle of the night, we had a beam of light shoot down a fire break where we were camping. Uh, we had a strange sunrise in the west. You know, once again, I don't know about Arkansas, but this part of the country, sun doesn't rise in the west. Uh, rises in the east. That's a recreation of what the sunrise looks like. And this is an actual photograph of the mysterious stick and pack. Uh, one of our team members set his pack on the ground before he went to bed that night. He woke up the next day and there was a stick woven under this left-hand side of his hip belt and laid over the top of the right side of the hip belt that wasn't there the evening before. If Sasquatch has been recorded to leave uh, gifts like that and markers like that. So this is seven miles from the meadow. So this is not only a really neat micro location, this whole area is really neat and teeming with uh, all kinds of strange happenings. When we got back to camp the next day, uh, the team, uh, some of the team members that did not go on the uh, hiking expedition had gone back out to the meadow and they saw a strange uh, series of tracks and I'll show you pictures of that a little bit later. But what they were, it, was, it looked as though something was dropped into the meadow, like, an, like I'm gonna say an automobile, but they're not tire tracks, but imagine two parallel compressed areas, went for a distance and then was lifted out. So it had a distinct starting in a distinct stopping part, the, the vegetation was bent over. 
was not broken. Ant hills inside of the track lines were not compressed. Where have we heard of that before? Crop circles, okay? But these were linear. The, uh, some other team members went out later, Dave and Terry, to look at these track lines. They took a full spectrum camera with them, which re re also records film and light in the ultraviolet and infrared range. When they would stand in the track line and point their camera down the track line, once again, they saw a cube or a box. This is a representation of what they saw. Only on the full spectrum camera was not visible to the naked eye. They'd step out of the track line, gone. Step back in it, there. Very excited, they went to hit the button to take a photograph of it, and they had left their SIM card back at base camp. <laughs> so, but the good news is I have affidavits from both of these gentlemen, one of whom is an electrical engineer. So, uh, you know, pretty squared away people. Uh, and that night, we saw this hulking figure on our FLIR on thermal. Almost like something was forming, just starting to wink into existence, and we were picking it up on FLIR. Uh, this is a representation of the, uh, the box, and then this is what the track lines look like. I do have a photograph of the track lines. It's very hard to see because I captured this image, pulled it off a GoPro, but you can see them right here. It was starting to remind me of another well-known location, many, many miles away in the west. Anybody want to take a stab at what that location's called? Yeah, all together now. Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch. It was, I was really amazed because a lot of the stuff that was happening out there was happening at my little location that we were researching. So it became really apparent that traditional investigative approaches wasn't sufficient. It just wasn't going to work. So far, we've had UAPs, we've had missing time, we've had physical transformations, strange GPS track lines, cryptids, missing time. So we had to really, really start looking at it from a different perspective. And what we started thinking about, what if the paranormal disciplines were all different facets of the same diamond. So what if we had one phenomena and the paranormal folks are looking at it from one perspective, cryptozoology from another, and ufology from another. So why don't we try different techniques from different disciplines? What might we gain out of that? So we decided we were gonna start taking tools out of the toolboxes of the various disciplines. In November 2019, we decided to do something rather unique and try something called the Estes method, or Estes protocol from the paranormal world. Uh, basically, you take a ghost box, and we've all seen ghost boxes on the TV shows, right? We know what the, that is. Except you take the ghost box, put it on some uh, earbuds that are sound canceling, and blindfold an individual known as the receiver. So he or she cannot hear what's going on around them, they can't see what's going on around them, and they have oh, no idea of the questions being asked. They can't see who's asking the questions or what's being asked. And we tried this in the meadow with some amazing results. The video you're getting ready to see has been edited for brevity. You can go to the, uh, the website and see the entire video. But this is a real video of a real SD session taking place in the video. And I'm not going to give you any pre preconceived notions, but ask yourselves after watching this, did we make contact with something? Are you of this earth? Once. All he does is he repeats the Where words are he hears you on now? the ghost box. Land. Are you responsible for the portals? Likely. Do you use the portals for transportation? Yes. Are the portals open to us? No. Are the portals dangerous? No. May we enter the portals? Once. We did once. We did once, yes. Are the portals a manifestation of plasma energy and electromagnetic fields. Now it starts to get upset. Leave. Because I'm starting to ask direct questions. I am going to list. Go. No, we're not going. I'm going to list some phenomenologies that precede the portals. 
electromagnetic fields. Stop it. Electromagnetic fields. Radiation. Microgravity. Power. Yes. So do you think we're in contact with something? I, I think so. January 2020, uh, there were only three members present for this expedition. We decided to record some EMF, RF, and radiation baselines in specific locations where we had encountered events of high strangeness. During that time, I became extremely disoriented. I'd been to this place probably 50 times before. Uh, I backpacked all over North America. I'm an Eagle Scout. I've hunted big game in Africa and the U.S. I'm pretty familiar with the woods and I'm pretty comfortable in it. We decided to cross the creek that's just to the south of the meadow and see what was on the other side. As soon as I crossed it, somehow I ended up back where I started from, okay? And I can't explain this, this is hard to articulate, but the field I walked into was different. It did not look the same. And I actually called out to my research partner. Uh, I found this new meadow, this new field. Won't this be cool to investigate? And she's like, okay, don't go anywhere. Stay where you're at. Let me come to you. And she came to me and she goes, Trey, you're in the meadow where we started. I said, no, we're not. And I argued with her. And she goes, no, no, look, we're right where we started. And once she said that, it's like I came out of a, a fog state and everything started kind of looking normal. This really started uh, bothering the guys back at base camp and they wanted to come out and get me. And I said, okay, just stop. You know, everybody just leave me alone for about 10 minutes and let me get my wits about me. Uh, what's interesting is when that happened, we had a radiation spike of 0.33 microsieverts per hour, which was well above the background radiation level of 0.06 microsieverts per hour. If I had not been using our safety protocols of having two investigators, two researchers together at all time with radio communications back to base camp, would have I have ended up like one of David Pilates uh, missing persons? Is that one of the things that happens? in these places of high strangeness, the people get disoriented and just disappear. In June 2020, uh, we decided to use another base camp because the base camp we were using was closed by the state due to COVID lockdowns. Uh, we had a vehicle locking and unlocking on its own. <clears throat> uh, we decided to try Stephen Greer's CE5 protocol in the meadow since many of my team members were remote viewers. Uh, while we were in the meadow, the individual manning base camp noticed a blacked out vehicle or vessel or craft. That's the only word I'm going to use. Drive by base camp. There was a, a gravel road probably about 40 meters away. He heard the distinctive sound of the crunch of gravel, but there were no lights in this craft as it passed. This was in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night, pitch black. The only way you could drive a vehicle down this road is if you're equipped with uh, the latest generation three or better night vision equipment. What's really crazy is when this craft passed by base camp, his Geiger counter spiked up to 0 0.60 microsieverts per hour. That's an actual photograph of the Geiger counter. So once again, we had a strange radiation spike, which uh, turns out to be an indicator of what high strangeness happens at this location. Uh, another one of my team members woke up the next morning, came to me, and he said, Hey, Trey, I had this really weird experience when I was asleep. Uh, the CE5 protocol, let me back up, did not yield anything. It was kind of a bust, we thought. He said, I woke up about 4.30 4 this morning, and I had this term in my mind, Knox Magby. Does that mean anything? I said, No, not to me. You know, it doesn't ring any bells. He said, Well, then I woke up at 6.30 again, and that phrase was in my mind. This individual is a graduate from the U.S. Air Force Academy with an engineering degree, spent several years in Air Force Special Operations, <clears throat> and is an expert in his field and travels all over the world doing various things. Very down-to-earth person. So I decided I was going to look into the term Knox Magby. But what I found out is Knox, also known as Nix in Greek, is the Roman goddess of the night. Knox. Magby is very similar to an old English word called magba, 
which I found in the point Beowulf, meaning kindred or children. The Romans occupied Britain until 400 CE. So it's reasonable that a person that spoke Old English would also have some familiarity with the Greek gods. So the terms were possibly contemporaneous in the early Middle Ages. So you put it together, it means children of the night goddess, okay? So, children of the night goddess. What do we have that come and visit people at night that are small like children and have big heads like children that have something to do with UAPs? Okay, really good illustration of it here in Whitley Stryber's book and a wonderful illustration by David Huggins, okay? The Grays. July 2020, uh, we had this sudden death of a crucial ASOG member. We're starting to see health effects now, people having ill health. He died all of a sudden, and he was one of the uh, early individuals that saw some of the uh, first uh, instances at the meadow. And so we gathered in July 2020 to memorialize him. Uh, we went back to this spot uh, where I had had that strange uh, disorientation, and we noticed this sapling right here. And this is an actual photograph of it. It's about 12 foot tall. It's on a small island in the middle of this uh, small river or large creek. There's really no way to get to it, to bend it over and manipulate it. And it was formed into a perfect oval, okay? Perfect oval, out in the middle of nowhere. This was the area, the exact spot where I had that disorientation and that radiation spike. Uh, there's a symbol called a galactic keyhole. It's the top of the onk. All over the world, this particular shape is seen in monuments, buildings, and other facilities that talk about some kind of gateway or portal. It's called the galactic keyhole. So here we have the galactic keyhole where I had my disorientation about 40 yards from where the box was, the cube. Uh, in February 2021, uh, we had a really neat UAP sighting up at Stevens Lake. Uh, we had two objects that appeared you can, right here and right here. They basically were two lights together flashing on and off. I looked at them through binoculars. I could not see any other uh, navigation lights, no uh, anti-collision beacons or navigation lights on either side. It was just these two parallel lights flashing on and off. Dropping very slowly, if you notice, they're from the top of the horizon, top, high in the sky, dropping below the horizon. An aircraft will start below the horizon and come up. And they're perfectly distanced from each other. And as they slowly make their way down below the horizon, that distance never changes. Uh, I took a uh, GPS reading of the exact location of the sighting a compass reading, and I went back into Flight Radar 24, I could find no records of corresponding aircraft. So, that's what we call a UAP, Unknown Aerial Phenomena. July 2021, uh, JJ's vehicle, while we were out, would arm and disarm the theft deterrent system by itself in base camp. Both JJ and MD had serious GPS navigation issues when heading home. Their GPSs would take them right back to the same spot. And KP had our automobile lose all electric functions just outside of Commerce, Georgia. Where else have we heard people that have had unique experiences? Now, KP was the same one that is now having dreams about beings coming into our bedroom. All of a sudden, in the middle of nowhere, her vehicle dies. Good example of that was Betty and Barney Hill. Okay. More hitchhikers. Several days after arriving home, KP had a strange photo appear on her iPhone in the gallery. The date stamp on the photo was for a time when the phone was literally a few feet from her head when she slept. No one admitted to sending this to her, her this strange photo, and it was also in her gallery as though she had taken it. It was later discovered that the photo was from a real estate listing not related to her in any form. Another field pops in on her phone or a piece of land for sale. Were, being, were we being sent a message? You know, we weren't able to get a team together fast enough to go out to this location and see if anything happened, but you know, are we being communicated with in some way? October 2021, we were joined by Katie Page. You hear Katie? 
Okay, she's back there. Uh, Colorado MUFON director. Uh, shadow figures were observed in the periphery of the meadow and voices were heard. Very faint, mumbling voices. FLIR yielded no contacts to explain the voices. We couldn't determine where they were coming from. We decided to explore two other fields that were within two miles of the original meadow. Several team members observed strange lights flashing in the, and flashing lights in the forest surrounding these fields. Katie's traveling companion and, and JJ were physically touched by an unseen force in one of these fields. They were, they were, now we're getting physically touched by something invisible. So this is being ramped up. I think I heard an unseen force there. Uh, in March 2022, once again, we had a very full cadre of researchers for this outing. We continued to conduct research in the two areas, and once again, the odd lights were present. We decided to place a pyramid shape in the meadow and left it overnight. It was filled with various trinkets. Then we aligned it north and south uh, with, the, with uh, magnetic north and south. Pennies were placed under each corner to mark the location and help detect if it had been moved or tampered with in any way. When we went back the next day to retrieve it, we were surprised to find only one item missing, a small rare earth magnet it was the only thing missing out of it. October 2022, we had a documentary film crew come along with us for this trip. As usual, the odd lights were present. The document, documentary director uh, wanted to experience an SD session for himself, okay? During his session, the words witch and Nephilim were heard. He said that he also experienced apocalyptic visions during the experience. Keep in mind, Nephilim is an old term, Old Testament term meaning giants. And some people believe that the Nephilim is an early description of Sasquatches or Bigfoot. So here we have, through the SD session, getting the term Nephilim. He was also witnessed by his uh, cinematographer and production assistant. This is a photograph of the actual session. They described, his assistant and cinematographer, described seeing shadow figures swirling around us as we conducted the session. Two members of his teams also had paranormal experiences involving hitchhikers when they got home. So once again, we're having the hitchhiker effect. This is the message, this is the actual message I got from the uh, film director. He said, so I've been able to speak with the others about what they saw. It was reported that while the uh, SD or SD's event was in progress, a shadowy, nearly invisible being would hover around me. It would appear to try to enter me and come back out. This happened several times and eventually went in and either didn't come out or vanished. All I remember from the event is images of destruction and these weird images of dead babies covered in blood. The shadow being was uh, reportedly somewhat humanoid with a partial body and the head of the being was said to resemble a person wearing a hood. It would seem that what was seen does correlate with what others have seen as they describe the shadow people. So this was an individual that had not been there before, brings a film crew out, and now we're experiencing this. Also during that trip, when the cinematographer approached an area about six meters in diameter out in the meadow, he would notice strange fluctuations in his battery life indicator of his professional grade video camera. When he was outside of this small area, and this is actually where the area is, I circled it. This is an aerial photograph of the meadow, and it was right in this area right here. When he would step into that area, or when he was outside of the area, his, his camera would read about 80% of battery life. When he would step into that area, it would drop down to 10%. When he would step out of it, it would go back up to about 80 step back in it, it would drop down to 10. So there was some sort of energy sink in that very, very tight location. But it's fluid. It's not always there. February 2023, hey, just a few months ago, okay? Uh, this weekend was plagued with extremely bad weather. The incessant rain and cold temperatures hampered our activities. However, we did have a few extraordinary events. We had a remarkable UAP sighting, not unlike Bob's first sighting in 2016, which the moon moved sideways. A diffused disk was sighted in the east at 105 degrees magnetic. It's worth noting that the moon rise was, a, was at about 2308 that day. At about 1108 was when the moon rises. 105 degrees is almost due east. The sun doesn't set in the east, okay? But yet they saw something that looked like a diffused sun, you know, the sun coming through the clouds. Uh, we also did a dousing experiment in the meadow. Uh, it was attempted, uh, a series of questions were asked with the dousing rods and asked if whatever could raise the readings on our Geiger counter from one of the baselines 
of 0 0.06 microsieverts per, per uh, hour to 0.13 microsieverts per hour. We specifically said, can you raise the readings on this Geiger counter to 0.13 microsieverts per hour, per hour? That is an actual photograph of what we got, 0.13 microsieverts per hour. We had another radiation spike. This is uh, the UAP sighting in their own words. Okay, kind of retell me everything you just, just said. Okay, so we were sitting here listening to the radio. Yeah, what, ta what time? Uh, it's uh, 5.15 uh, Central Time. Okay. 5.05. 5, 5, 5. 5.05 okay, Central Time. Okay, 17.05, okay. And I just, it's, it's been raining all day long, and I said, well, the sun's coming up, or the sun's starting to peek through over there, and then I, it hit me. I said, well, that's the wrong direction. Double check the yeah, we double check the compass, and it's it's pointing in, in the easterly direction. Okay, and I just checked it with my compass. It's 105 degrees. Okay, magnetic. And it was just above the ridge, and it looked like the sun behind the clouds. It was a diffused light, not a bright flashlight like a flashlight or something pointing at you. It was a diffused light, just like the sun setting. And then it moved from right to left. It moved over a few degrees and then it got out of my line of sight and moved past some thicker trees but it, then it got into edge. I can see from this position. Right. And what color was it? It was white. like a whitish, um, yeah, it wasn't really, maybe just a slight tint of orange right. it, when I first seen it. But right. then it was more white. And when I saw it over here, it actually could have been the moon. Yeah. It was, I, but it was probably yeah. a full moon. I don't know. What, what, uh, what position the moon's in today, but it looked like yeah. there could have been a full moon behind the clouds. That was his <laughs> next thing, was it? Well, that's the, the moon rising. Yeah, yeah. You know, sure don't see it now, and it's clearing up. Yeah, so I don't know, I don't know what it was. Which, which is interesting because Bob saw the exact same thing here in 2016. Over that ridge. Over that ridge. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know. Well, I appreciate it. My battery is getting ready to go dead here. So, yeah. anything y'all want to add? Uh, we're gonna keep our eyes peeled and see what else we see here. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Just like the event that started it all. And this is a uh, this is a moon chart of exactly when moonrise is. And it at 11:08 p.m. 23:08 hours that night. So it obviously was not the, the moonrise. Uh, we also try to do some scientific experiments while we're out there. We'll take uh, two stopwatches, start them at the same time in base camp, leave one in base camp as a control, put another one out in the meadow as an experiment. As of yet, we've seen no time fluctuation. We've also done a sealed letter experiment, which is taken from uh, paranormal experimentation, uh, from uh, the SORAD experiments done at Duke University, type of list of questions. Uh, in those experiments at Duke, they would get responses inside of a sealed envelope from forces unknown. We have not yielded any results on our experiments. And also we've created a, uh, a box uh, with magnetic letters that we'll seal up out there and see if the letters have been moved around or spell anything. And as of now, nothing significant happened. I mentioned uh, Tim passing away in 2020. I would be negligent if I didn't talk about health effects. There's some danger to this, okay? I'm not gonna lie to you. Of the two individuals that were filmed entering the portal, one passed away in July of 2021, and one has had his prostate cancer return with a vengeance, with a vengeance. One member, after spending a few hours in the meadow, had to be medically evacuated to an emergency, to local emergency department with heart palpitations. We had to literally medevac that person out of the field. We've had another teammate that has been suffering from severe respiratory issues after starting to investigate the meadow. There's other research going on about the health effects of people who have encountered high strangeness. Uh, the DOD has recently admitted that uh, they have been looking into health effects of pilots that have been in the vicinity of UAPs. Uh, Gary Nolan has been doing some uh, research with MRIs of the brains of people who have had uh, encounters with high strangeness, and he's reported, if I'm not mistaken, things that look very similar to MS scarring of the brain. 
So the health effects are real. So if you ever decide to get into this business, go into it fully form, informed and realize that it could affect your health or the health of your friends and loved ones. What does the future look like? Well, we're in the process of arranging a hypnotic regression for several members of the team with a hypnotherapist in the Atlanta area. So we're working on getting that set up. We've had uh, the hypnotherapist that actually agreed to do uh, the work pro bono, so we're trying to get that set up. And we've also been working with a field deployable version of the Coroner God Helmet developed by Dr. William uh, Robert Persinger, Mr. Stan Corin. February 23 was the first time we uh, tried it in the field setting using only battery power. So we're trying some different things uh, to, to open up the, the threshold so maybe we can start getting more information, more data from whatever. So, what's going on? Is it extraterrestrials? You know, is it the, the EBE theory, extra terrestrial biological entities? Are we dealing with other dimensions? Are we dealing with a natural phenomena? Or what about a multiverse that exists adjacent to ours? Bottom line up front, we don't know. Okay, we have no idea. It's kind of like the ants in the road, okay? I want you to imagine a forest. Very, very remote, very, uh, very pristine, and the Forest Service, or the state, decides to build a road right through the middle of it. And about 20 yards from this road is an ant hill. So they build this road through the forest, and the ants pop up out of the hill, and they go over to the road. They don't know what a road is. They have no frame of reference for a road. So they sit there putting out little pheromones, trying to communicate with the road and doing whatever it is ants do. And the, frame, the road is so outside of their frame of reference, they can't even comprehend it. We're the ants. This phenomenon is the road. It's so outside of our understanding of the world that maybe we can't even comprehend what's going on. Coast to Coast AM. We switch gears to talk about paranormal hotspots, long-term hubs of high strangeness, places like Skinwalker Ranch. Now there is a new alleged hotspot being investigated by some groups headed by Trey Hudson. The location is considered the South Skinwalker Ranch to be kept confidential until sometime in the future. My guest is Mr. Trey Hudson. Trey Hudson joins us to share his research. It's like Skinwalker Ranch all over again. Yeah, there's some weird stuff going on. We've got every single thing going on there, here in our little location. The cool thing is, nobody knows where our location is. It's pristine. We've had strange orbs and lights. Moved a distance of about 200 yards and in five or six seconds. Mysterious voices coming out of nowhere. Men in black. UFOs, missing time, cryptids. I think it's one of those places where this dimension and this dimension or this timeline and this timeline get off the course. The most significant event that we've documented so far would have to be the portals. It looks like it's forming again. See the square box? Oh, you see the X beside it or the cross? To my knowledge, this is totally unique in the field of paranormal investigation. Oh, you're right on the edge, but it is fading away. First thing I noticed, it is extremely cold. To me, it was like a darkened curtain had been pulled in front of us. Did they just disappear? This isn't your average paranormal team. We come from a whole bunch of different backgrounds that involve high stress situations military, law enforcement, emergency medicine, intelligence. I'm a former Army intelligence officer. I also was an anti-terrorism officer in Afghanistan. When things get really, really weird and really, really strange, it's very, very probable that people can be frightened or lose focus on exactly what we're trying to do. But because of these backgrounds of the team members, 
they're able to stay on task. The more we research, the more we investigate, the more data we gather, it might help us understand our place in the universe just a little bit better. It might actually answer the ultimate question, are we alone? If anybody interested, I wrote a book about this. You can get a hard copy, ebook, audio book uh, on Amazon. Just type in my name, Trey Hudson. You know, if any, and the book goes into a lot more details about some of the stuff. I've got a few copies here if anybody's interested. So I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I enjoy telling this story to the world. It's, it's not my story. It doesn't belong to myself or my team. It's the world's story. It would be very, very selfish of us not to uh, share it. Uh, this is my experience. This is my reality. So I ask that you just uh, consider some of the things that we've talked about here today. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> now I believe we can take some questions if anybody has... Uh, anything. Uh, and I think they're going to bring a microphone up here. If you have any questions, I'll line up right here on the, uh, the line. <clears throat> That's so we can uh, get a good idea of what you're, uh, what you're asking, and I can hear you. Hi. Yes, um, it's my first year. I'm kind of new to all this, mm -hmm. but I do think language is important. I've always heard of uh, UFOs, UFOs, and now all of a sudden this past year I'm hearing about, how did you refer to it? UAPs. UAPs, so why the change in language? Uh, that's a great question, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I didn't make up the term UAP, nor am I old enough to have made up the term UFO. But here's, you know, here's it's a change of thought. Is some people are looking at these phenomena, you know, it used to be that we thought that UFOs un unidentified flying objects. You know, it was the, the residents of Zeta Reticuli hopping in their intergalactic Cadillac and driving over to Earth, you know, and, and giving us a wave as they drove by. They were physical things. They were machines. Now we're looking at it a little bit differently, and maybe these aren't machines in the way we understand machines. Remember, they ain't in the road. Maybe we're looking at the, whatever their craft are, and they're not a machine in any way we understand machines. So now they're called... Uh, unexplained aerial uh, phenomena. You know, it could be plasma, it could be a craft, it could be anything. Do it's you know, a little bit more accurate description. Do you know who coined that phrase? I believe it was uh, the military, the government, DOD started using it, if I'm not mistaken. I think they were some of the first ones that came up with the UAP. Well, just real quick, there's, there's documents going back to 1956 referring to UAPs. Oh, 1956? Okay. In the military? You ready? Oh, you hold it. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi. I, first off, I appreciate the scientific approach with the equipment. Is there any geologic correlations like the quartz, quartz crystals in, yeah, yeah. in the site? Yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of correlations with uh, aquifers, you know, like uh, subsurface water, and quartz in areas of high strangeness. Now, quartz is, is one of those rocks that has a unique piezoelectric, yeah, piezoelectric uh, capabilities, exactly. where if you mm -hmm. compress it, it generates electricity. Mm -hmm. So how does quartz correlate to these areas of high strangeness? You know, we don't really know why, but it does seem like, you know, in areas where you have a high concentration of quartz, you'll hear about, you know, UAPs, you'll hear about ghosts, hauntings, yeah. things like that. So there is some sort of correlation. The reason I ask is, I, um, I work at Board Camp Crystal Mine down, down by Mina, and I measure the magnetic fields quite accurately. Mm -hmm. And we've had several portal openings at that site that correlated directly with the alignment of the faults down there. Sure. H have you done measurements of the, of the fault structures in the area of the meadow? Uh, we haven't yet. I actually have a good friend of mine, James Keenan, who you've probably seen on some of the shows. Uh, he wants to come out and do, he's an expert in subterranean stuff and uh, geomagnetic anomalies. So that's, that's on our list of things to do. Do you know Gary Hart? I do not. Okay. okay. Right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Hey, th outstanding presentation, by Thank the you. way. But uh, several times during the, your uh, 
thoughts. I kept reflecting on uh, Edgar Mitchell and Ray Hernandez, Beyond UFOs, the multiple contact modalities, the facets, different facets. And it, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, maybe all of these are pathways to contacts with non-human intelligence. Right. That's, a, that's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, one of my favorite researchers is the legendary John Keel, okay? And he looked at things in a very broad sense. He called these entities ultra-terrestrials, okay? Which, you know, I kind of like that term, and this was, I think he first used that in his book, uh, The Mothman Prophecies. The term I use is paradimensionals, okay? There's something beyond our dimension. And like the video I showed you of the entities showing up on FLIR, okay? If I'm a ghost guy, I'm going to look at it, well, those are ghosts, obviously. Those are ghosts. That's dead Uncle Fred. Or if I'm a Bigfoot reacher, I'm going to say, those are two baby Bigfoots. Or if I'm a ufologist, I'm going to say, well, those are two grays frolicking in the woods. Well, maybe it's all of those things and none of those things. And we have to have a really broad mind and reach out into the other disciplines and pull their best practices into our toolbox to really get a better idea of what's going on. Because I think if we don't do that, we're really selling ourselves short. Thank you, excellent question. Based upon your experiences and what you've observed, what have you concluded is true that the rest of the world isn't caught up with yet? Uh, probably if I had to surmise it into one thing is the world is a heck of a lot stranger than you realize. I mean, that is something, <laughs> You know, I tell people that, they're like, oh, golly, you know, these places, uh, I just wish I could find one. I'm like, if you do the research, I'm, and I'll, I'll go on a tangent with that. I'm an old school intel guy. I was trained uh, with our, our Army Intelligence. Thank you for that bark of uh, affirmation there. Uh, I was trained, uh, bow wow to you too, sir. Uh, I was trained as an old school Army Intelligence officer in the Cold War. And back then, we rode dinosaurs into combat. No, not quite that old. But we used acetate, we used uh, big clear films we would put over our maps and we would mark things, you know, with grease pencils. So I want you to imagine a map of somewhere and you take an acetate and you say, okay, I'm gonna take a brown marker, I'm gonna mark all the Bigfoot sightings, do 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 Okay, and I'm put that away, put a new one up. Take a yellow marker, I'm gonna mark all the ghost sightings. Put that away, put one up, and I'm gonna use blue and I'm gonna mark all the UAP sightings. Now you take those three overlays and you put them together and you're gonna see concentrations. Okay, that's where the weirdness happens. And those places are a lot more common than we think. So all somebody has to do is do their research, and they might find one of these places in their backyard. I think they're, that, I think they're more prevalent than we realize. Thank you. I have two questions. One is, what is the theory? Is this like accidental dimensions colliding? or intentional? Boy, I got a great answer for you on that. Uh, here's the thing, is it could be several things. One, is I mentioned the multiverse theory, I mentioned the uh, extra dimensional theory. You know, one is if you had two multi-universes existing side by side and they just get so close where they don't quite touch, because if they touch they might annihilate one another, but it allows a transference of information, intelligence, data, and maybe physical objects between the two universes. Another uh, theory is it's a, it's a dimension that exists beyond our own. We know that exists. We know that exists through science, quantum science. We know that exists through things like remote viewing. And perhaps whatever this entity is, is dropping down into our dimension for a split second and then coming back out. Maybe that's what UAPs are. They're dropping down in our dimension and coming back out. Is it natural? Well, I'll give you an example of that. Wind is a natural phenomenon. We can use wind as a natural phenomenon as you're standing there and it blows against your face. We can harness a natural phenomenon with wind by using windmills or sailboats. Or we've developed the technology to create and manufacture wind using large wind generating fans. So maybe whatever the intelligence is has developed the technology to, to, to uh, create these, these doorways or maybe it's a natural phenomenon, kind of like you alluded, that they just exploit for their own use. The answer is we don't know, but there's a lot of different theories out there. I have another question. Okay. Um, uh, do we know that from the other side, they appear to be mean, but are they not as afraid of us as we are of them? Right, 
you know, uh, I think they're so different is we would have to be awfully strange to them too. Unless they're so technologically advanced, it'd be like, uh, you know, some of the uh, expeditions back in, you know, the 1950s that would go deep into the rainforest and, and look at the indigenous population. And these researchers are so far advanced in the indigenous population technologically that the indigenous population didn't even know how to relate to them. So, you know, it could be that. My last question okay. is, how can you not be scared when you're doing this stuff? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and the thing is, is we've developed real, really rigid protocols. And like I said before, the team is, comes from backgrounds that are used to dealing with really hairy situations. And we just get so focused on the protocol and our mission that we don't get wigged out until we get back to base camp and have a few, uh, few shots of Jack Daniels. <laughs> Then it's like, whoa, what just happened, you know? Hi. Um, so for context of my question, um, certain government documents, both our government and other governments, have referenced specific radio ranges that are associated, radio frequency ranges that are associated oh, yeah. with UAB. Um, one of your slides mentioned spurious uh, ham radio transmissions. Mm -hmm. I was curious what frequencies that you've been looking at. Yeah, that was, uh, and I'm sorry I, did, I, I glazed over that. That was actually during one of our... Uh, one of our uh, expeditions, and we had a, uh, a voice come over the radio, call out the uh, call sign, ham radio call sign, of a, a specific member. Now, it was really weird because when you come into a ham radio net or frequency, you identify yourself and who you're calling. This was just this individual's uh, call sign. Do you know whose individual's call sign that was? Bob's. And it was, happened as a female voice, happened one time. Now, you're talking about the, uh, the 1.3 gigahertz and the 1.6 gigahertz. What I heard was the 2.995 up to 3 gigahertz. I haven't heard about that. Uh, if you're interested in that, look, look into something called the Frey effect, which is uh, effects on human, uh, humans at about 1.3 gigahertz. Makes, makes for good reading. Howdy, sir. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, my question would be, do you guys intend to go back to this very same place and try to video more? Next month. Okay, then, then the second part of my question is, at the distance it appears you guys are videoing this, it seems like it's a long ways away. What's it keeping from moving any closer to get more detail? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, 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 the video makes it appear a lot further than it is. We were probably 35 meters, 40 meters away from the box when it formed. We weren't that far away. And the problem is, is if you're filming something, if you're capturing, now all of our equipment has to be man portable. We have to pack it all in. So we don't have big stationary tripods and stuff like that. So a lot of it's handheld. And if you bring it down to walk towards it, you know, where did it go? So, you know, it's, it's a good question. You have to kind of weigh your thing. What we did is we did vector a team in towards it while we ca captured them on video. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, it sounded like it looked like you might be making a documentary. Is that correct? If so, when will it be out? Oh, <laughs> I, can't really, I can't really go into that right now. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, 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 what, here's, I will say this. I will say this. It, I think this, would, would everybody say this is a pretty cool story? Yeah, okay. I, yeah I think it is too. I'm, huh? I got your book. It's very good. Oh, it is. Well, thank you. Uh, so, hey, we got an endorsement here. Get your copies now. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, yeah, it's a really cool story, and I would really like for this story to go out to a larger audience, be documentary or whatever. Uh, because, like I said, it's not my story. It's, it's not, you know, it, this isn't something I want to keep secret. I want the world to know about this. Because maybe in my story getting out there, some other group might say, wow, this corresponds with what we're doing. Or he's using the Estes method. That's really good. Maybe we ought to use it too. And that's how we learn from each other and from each other's experiences. So I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that I can make that work. Let's everybody keep our fingers crossed and uh, be a positive manifestation of that in the future. But thank you. Hey, uh, uh, this location is a secret, apparently, yes. right? Yeah. Obviously, somebody initially found something strange going on there. And of course, yes. you can tell that the land has been farmed. And, yeah. you know, in, in other words, how did you guys get how were you notified? Yeah, what we did is, uh, you know, like I said before, we were researching folklore. Um, my background is as a paranormal investigator. That's kind of, I'm a ghost guy, or started off as a ghost guy. Now I'm kind of a weird crapologist or whatever. Uh, 
And we, uh, you know, we were looking at this haunted road. And while we were looking at this haunted road, this really crazy UAP experience happened back at base camp. We're like, I ah, forget that haunted road craziness. This is where the action is. So we just kind of stumbled into this. But then when I really started researching this area, you know, really researching it, going and looking at, you know, the National UFO Reporting Center and looking at, you know, MUFON reports and looking at a BFRO report, Bigfoot uh, Research Organization, I started seeing, you know, concentrations and correlations. And that's, you know, kind of helped us uh, pin down exactly where to research. And like I said before, this isn't just a, a, a micro location. And uh, Katie can, can attest to this. We've started looking at different locations, and we're also having these strange phenomena, which runs another weird question. Is the phenomena based on location or is it based on people? I don't know, you know. Chicken or the egg? You had a... Uh quickly uh, went over, you were going to, uh, you and your group are going to seek out a quantum healing hypnotic technique, which I'd like to say, Dolores, if you're with us, we love you. <laughs> but um, what, could you expand on that and why you were thinking of... No, which technique? The uh, quantum healing hypnotic technique, the regressive hypnotherapy. Oh, yeah, well, you kind of brushed over that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What we were looking at on that is actually uh, some of, several of my team members have had some really crazy experiences like you know if you're sitting at base camp and a blacked out vessel drives past you with a radiation spike you know there might be more to that you know subconsciously also the uh the the, the team member that's had recurrent dreams of things coming into her room something i did mention she actually has physical marks on her body so uh, i'm really looking at it more through the optics of uh, john mack you know bud hopkins that kind of stuff uh and through uh you know self-disclosure perhaps healing, uh, but also, you know, the team members, they want to know what's going on. Uh, obviously, they're brave people or they wouldn't be out doing this. So they're, they're just as curious as anybody else. But getting my team members linked up with hypnotherapists and schedules is like herding cats. So I haven't been successful in doing that yet. But once again, you know, good thoughts. Let's make that happen, you know. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, thank you so much. I, I hope you all enjoyed it. Go out there and have your own adventures and make your own stories.